Hey folks, today we are cutting straight to the chase with a power pack guide on how to nail those FANG or FANG equivalent data engineering interviews. So grab your notepad, buckle up and let's dive head first into everything that you need to know to conquer this challenge like a total pro. So what do I mean by FANG equivalents? Well, they are very good product companies that pay almost as much as FANG does or sometimes even more. They are generally smaller and they have really interesting tech stack to work on. And their interview process is very similar to most of the FANG companies because a lot of employees there are like X Google, X Meta, X Amazon, etc. And what you are seeing on the screen right now is the list of such companies. As you might know, I'm Josh. I'm a senior software engineer working in DoorDash in data and AI field. And previously I was in data and AI engineer at Google. Before we jump in, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you have haven't already this really helps me out a lot and also a huge shout out to our sponsor Amber which is the best place for students to find accommodation abroad more about them later in this video as you might know there are mainly two types or broad categories of interviews one is technical and second is non-technical or also known as behavioral I'm not going to cover anything about the behavioral rounds in this video because I feel like it's a completely separate topic in this video I'm going to be sticking to technical interviews and I'll cover number one what all interview rounds are there number two uh, what kind of questions to expect and how what is the best way to answer them number three I will also be sharing the resources so that you can get better at each of these rounds and number four I will be sharing some additional tips and tricks that will be helpful during your interview process so now let's understand what does the process of interview looks like at FANG or equivalent data engineering companies number one DSA sometimes a single round and in few of the companies also two separate rounds for DSA number two uh, data modeling and SQL sometimes uh, they are separate but most of the times they are stitched together in a single interview round number three system design and number four role related knowledge are also known as RRK rounds these interview rounds are mostly divided into two phases screening round and on-site rounds so screening round happens after you have been shortlisted your resume is selected you had a call with recruiter and they feel like you are a good fit for the role after that the screening round happens and if you get through then you get a series of interview rounds afterwards which is called as on-site rounds the reason i'm using quotes is because nothing really happens on-site nowadays it's mostly virtual but that's how still they are being referred to which is a little weird but it is what it is so if you don't do well in one of those on-site rounds you're not rejected straight away there you have to wait for the decision after all your rounds are completed at least that's how it is in most companies okay so now we understand the high level interview process let's look at what you can expect in each of these rounds we have collectively decided to punish ourselves with data structures so let's jump into DSA where you will be given one or two problems and you have to solve it within 45 minutes of time and sadly this is the round that is toughest for data engineers because you might be a really good data engineer but you might be really bad at DSA because you have not been practicing the thing about DSA round is you can stick to any language Python Java Kotlin Go uh, C, C++, C Sharp, Rust, JavaScript. Well, you get the point, right? I mean, there's no weight given to the language that you use, so it doesn't matter. There's a misconception though, that if you use Python, that interviewer will be less likely to be impressed because there are a lot of libraries in Python and you can write a very short code uh, compared to other languages but that's not really true for example if one of the subtasks in your dsa problem is about sorting a list then you can easily do list.sort in python if you do that then you can ask interviewer that hey is this okay can i use the direct python function or do you want me to write the exact sorting algorithm and even if you do use sort and the interviewer asks hey what is the actual sorting function behind this python sorting function you should know the answer to that the number one place to get started and to be familiar with all the different algorithm patterns and data structure questions is by going through this book cracking the coding interview you can learn a lot from this book and this book also contains some sample interview questions which will be really helpful these are the most common interview question patterns that you will come across once you're done with the basics you can go to lead code and pick your favorite language and start coding in websites like lead code you will mostly find three levels of difficulty easy medium and hard but in reality they can be divided into four different categories because medium is generally very broad so i would personally divide them into easy 
medium medium hard and hard now you'll be wondering what the heck is medium hard right generally as per my experience 80 percent of the problems that lead code categorizes as medium are actually medium and only 20 percent of them are from medium hard how many coding questions should i solve in my experience solving about 100 to 200 lead code questions from the category easy and medium out of the four categories that we just discussed is sufficient so try to solve all the problems from easy and medium and if you can solve like 80 percent of medium problems that you face in the 100 or 200 questions you're good just remember after solving your 50th lead code problem at around 2 a.m you might start dreaming in pseudocode. Trust me, happens to the best of us. You need to strategically prep for targeted companies. So let's say if you're applying for Google, then you need to look at Google's previously asked questions, which will be available on lead code. But you don't want to solve more questions than in the range of 100 to 200, because there are more rounds that you need to worry about as well. When you are giving your DSA interview, divide your time. So first three to five minutes should go into reading the question, understanding the problem and clearing out any questions if you have. Next five to 10 minutes, you should think about the approach. Just at a high level, think about the pseudocode that you will be implementing. After that, next 10 to 15 minutes, you should be coding. But before coding, always verify if your approach is the right one. Always review it with the interviewer first. And even when you are coding, try to explain as much of your code as possible uh, to the interviewer. I have been an interviewer as well. And let me tell you something. Most of people that get rejected in DSA rounds, they get rejected because of their inability to explain what they are coding instead of coding so communication is as important as your coding strategy last five to ten minutes of your approach you should uh, spend on optimizing it in terms of time complexity most common patterns are sliding window two pointers uh, divide and conquer type of algorithms searching and sorting algorithms even in tree and graph they usually stick to traversal algorithms like bfs and dfs and recursion also helps in optimizing your code or at least making it shorter and easier to read are you a student heading to the us or other countries abroad for studying and the search of accommodation almost feels impossible high prices limited availability and complete lack of reliable listings sounds familiar right but what if you had a simple trustworthy solution at your fingertips ember which makes your student accommodation search completely hassle-free. With options over 250 cities globally, including hotspots like New York, LA, SF, Boston, Ember's got something for every budget in your preference. It's not just in US. Ember services most top cities in UK, Australia, Ireland, Canada, Germany, and Spain. Looking to stay near NYU, UCLA, Harvard, or MIT? Ember connects you directly with properties that fit your needs, minus the stress. All you have to do is apply a relevant filter of your location, and more and you'll find trusted accommodation. Their exceptional 24-7 customer support means you will never face any bumps on the road. Ready to find your ideal place? Click the link in the description below to explore Ember and book your home away from home. Start your adventure in new countries like US with a complete peace of mind. Now back to our video. Data modeling and SQL. Now that our brains are fried from DFS and BFS, let's bring some relational drama into the mix. Sometimes these are two different rounds, but most of the times they are rolled into one. This is how it starts for an example. Uh, you are a data engineer hired to build a data model for an e-commerce company. What would you do? What you need to do here is stop. Stop yourself from directly giving an answer. This is the biggest mistake that I've seen candidates make. You need to ask a lot of clarifying questions to get a more clarity of the use case because building a data model of e-commerce website, that's a very, very vague use case. So you need to ask a lot of questions to narrow down your problem. For example, one of the questions can be, what data analysis do you want to do on top of this model? And let's say you got an answer like, I want to see top merchants and bottom merchants by region and by country. And I also want to see trend charts over time of merchant sales and order volume and profit. So after asking this simple question, now you know that you need to uh, use merchant data. You also need to use consumer data because that might contain information about regions. You might also need product data because that may contain information about different product categories. You may also need orders data because that can contain information about different transactions. So now that you know what all high level entities you will be needing, you need to identify fact tables. So fact tables are the one with significant numerical value that makes sense for business. In our case, fact table will be order transactions data and all other tables like consumer, merchant or product or region, they will mostly be 
uh, dimensional data. So after you have listed down entities and facts and dimensions, you need to list down different columns, different primary keys of the fact table and you need to list down again different columns of dimensions that you'll be using. You'll have to identify different foreign keys, the grain of the tables for each of them and you have to also link them together. What will be the relationship? Will it be one to one, many to many and so on. You usually start with a logical data model and then you move on to a physical data model where you think about partitioning, bucketing or maybe even storage structure or indexing at some point. But this entire process should not take more than 15 to 20 minutes because you will have SQL questions after this most of the time within the same round. If you want to prepare better for data model use cases, I recommend going through number one, dimensional data modeling by Kimball. This will highlight the overall process that you need to know for data model from a theoretical point of view. And then you need to go through Data Warehouse Toolkit book. Now this book is really long, so you don't need to go through the entire book, but you will find use cases section for different data model examples like human resources, telecom, e-commerce and much more. So more of these examples you go through, better you'll become at data modeling. After you create the data model, you will be asked SQL questions on the same data model that you created. So mostly you'll be asked three or five different SQL questions and they would be incremental in nature of difficulty. So they would start with the most easy question, like something like with a normal group by first and then they would go to joining and then self joining or uh, something like using window functions and sub queries or CTs. You will have to write around three to five SQLs within 10 to 15 minutes. So you need to be really quick in this round. How do you become better at SQL? It's just like DSA. So the best place to learn SQL would be through going to a website like W3 schools and get the basics right. But once you have done that, you need to go to lead code and start solving problems. One resource that I recommend is the SQL 50 resource. This has 50 different SQL questions. Most of them are easy and medium and some of them are hard. You can go through all of them. Overall aim to practice at least 50 to 70 SQL questions before you go into the interview. System design. This will be one of the toughest rounds that you will be facing in the entire interview process. And the difficulty of this will keep on increasing as you get more years of experience. Let's look at some sample questions. Imagine you have millions of IoT devices, each emitting sensors data every second. Your goal is to collect this data, process it in real time to detect anomalies and store both raw and processed data in a scalable data store. How would you design an end-to-end -end solution? Similar to data modeling, if you directly jump into answering instead of asking questions, you're already as good as rejected. So what are some sample questions that you can ask in this case? Is our main goal anomaly detection or there are other analytical needs as well like predictive maintenance or user behavioral analysis? Is the data structured, semi-structured or completely unstructured? Is the data coming in a constant rate or if there are any expected spikes like daily peaks or event driven bursts? How do we handle authentication of devices, etc.? So why ask question? System design is all about choosing one technology over another. For data ingestion alone, you will have three or four different options. Similarly, you'll have all these options for orchestration or data processing, storage, etc. So you need to compare the pros and cons of all of these three, four different options in each layer of your pipeline. And that should be related to the use case that you're solving. So in order to understand the use case better, you have to ask questions, but spend no more than five minutes on asking these questions and next two to three minutes on analyzing the answers of these questions. After that, only you start with the high level system design. To be better at high level system design, you need to do these four things. And this is common across different cloud platforms. But for the sake of this example, let's assume that uh, you have AWS experience or you are learning AWS. So number one thing that you need to do is do a cloud certification like Solutions Architect Associate in AWS. This will give you an idea of all different services and you will know when to use what. Number two, use most common open source services like Spark, Flink, Airflow, Kafka, which are used very frequently in data engineering pipelines. If you want to look at the entire uh, list of services, I would recommend look at my roadmap. I have mentioned everything there. Number three, at least create two to three different data engineering projects. If you don't have data engineering experience, create a free tier AWS account and uh, do everything there. Even if you do need to pay for services, do it uh, and set up like a budget of normal 10 or $20 and you will be fine with that. You'll easily be able to create projects within that budget. If you want to look for data sets, I would recommend on AWS, there is open data on AWS to get all the data available data sets for your project. They are sorted by different domains. And then number four, refer to as many of reference architectures as possible. 
so in aws there is an aws architecture center so more of these uh, reference architectures you go through the better you'll become and understand that there is no right choice there is no one right answer of system design uh, you have to essentially justify why the choices you made uh, is good for the given use case as long as you're able to do that you're good spend about 10 to 15 minutes doing the high level design and spend about 10 to 15 minutes doing the low level design where you talk about small components in your data pipelines about all of their configurations how will you do authentication which part of pipeline will be exposed to what type of user what will be the data grain so all of these things will be a part of your low level system design don't forget non-functional things as well like performance governance data lineage observability restartability etc now let's talk about role related knowledge round. So this is where they can ask very broad set of questions without sticking to any particular format. If your role requires cloud experience or cloud knowledge, then expect questions similar to what you are asked in the certification exam. Uh, mostly they are like scenario based. You may also be asked about Spark or Snowflake related questions if they are in the job description. For example, Spark questions can be like, uh, if my job ran out of driver memory issue, what can be the reason? How can I fix it? Uh, in Snowflake, they can ask you about how best to do clustering of a given table. But these are just examples. As you get more experience in the data engineering field, this round can also contain questions about project management, stakeholder management, project requirements gathering. So as you get the gist that there is no uh, particular set of questions or format for this round. So it's always better to talk with the recruiter before you have this round to understand what kind of questions might come up so you can prepare better. And that's about it. I know this was a really long video, but I'm sure this will be really helpful if you want to apply for any data engineering role in any good company. Let's talk about your thoughts, questions, comments in the comment section below. Do not forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. See you next time.